Hello everybody, I'm Graham Carvelin. Today I'll be presenting on web tools that I've developed for the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency where I'm an air resources specialist. So we have a list of web tools here as well as the sensor lending program where we hand out sensors to the public. We've also got the air sensor dashboard which has a number of tools including the purple air downloader, community reporter, the sensor map, which is kind of standalone, kind of a part of the dashboard, and uh, just an internal tool to connect to AWS and help um, work with these shiny apps. So for the sensor lending program, we have been lending out monitors to community groups and individuals, including the Dylos, Purple Air, and Air Beams. And uh, our program's been running for about a year, year and a half now and we've had a number of people request sensors and uh, I would say there's about a quarter of them who are interested in air pollution an air pollution source near them and a lot of that here in our area is wood smoke related and then we've got maybe two-thirds that are interested in using these sensors as educational tools a number of people who borrowed them for their kids to teach them about air quality. We even had some kids um, take them to their uh, school science fair and they won the science fair by presenting about, you know, their walk around their neighborhood with the Dylos. So that was exciting to see. Um, when people apply for the uh, sensor loan, they fill out a quick questionnaire to get an idea of what their interests are, what their question is, and, you know, that's really kind of the starting point. We contact them after that and usually have a phone call or, or a chat over email and just try and kind of get a feel for what they're trying to learn by using the sensor. And sometimes just in that conversation, we find out that there are existing resources that can help them. Um, maybe another agency or a fire department that's able to help them with, let's say, like an outdoor burning complaint. And sometimes um, sensors are the right tool. And then we ship them the sensors and uh, with some information on how to operate them, how to analyze the data, and how to think about the use of a sensor is kind of like a mini scientific study. So the air sensor dashboard has uh, three tools currently, which are a map, the sensor map, a download tool for purple air data, and a reporting tool. This is the Purple Air Downloader. You can select sites to download using the map on the left with a rectangle or polygon selection, or you can search by ID or name. And what this tool allows you to do is you select a date range, and then you can average the data from minute to hour to day, apply a 75% data completeness, and then check the boxes for QC filtering or calibration which we'll talk about uh, during the sensor map section and change the output uh, time zone as well. And you can have different start and end dates for different sets of monitors. The output of this is a single Excel ready CSV. And what that means is you could just open it up in Excel and start making graphs or analyze it in your favorite analysis program. Then we have the community reporter which is a tool that is used in conjunction with our sensor lending program. So it supports the sensors that we lend out and the public can take those sensors, record information, and then upload it to the community reporter, which crunches the numbers and gives them back this PDF output with some graphs of what those sensors said. To upload the data, you select one or multiple files and then you can within those files select the chunk of data that you're interested in which is a process called labeling and so you can select on a map or on this time series and basically tag the information that you're interested in so you could compare one area to another or one point in time to another point in time once you've labeled the data, you can calibrate it to the nearest reference site. Then you can um, create a hypothesis. 
So we try and um, have people thinking about their use of these sensors to answer their question in at least a semi-scientific way. You know, I have this concern about um, wood smoke, you know, and during the nighttime. So I, my hypothesis is that my purple air is going to be highest at night. Or I think that this one area in my neighborhood has higher concentrations than the other because I see a lot of diesel trucks idling there. So I'm going to walk around my neighborhood, I'm going to label that area, and then I'm going to label the background, and then I'm going to compare those two. So that's what the hypothesis section is for. Once you have clicked the Analyze Data button, the da uh, Download Data and Download Report buttons pop up, and you can get that Excel ready file with the process data and also the PDF report. The report has a background info section that uh, users are able to fill out and uh, along with some summary statistics, calibration, if there is a calibration applied, a time series, a map, a graph of the hour of day with some text along with those. And then an analysis of the hypotheses. So here we hypothesized that Capitol Hill PM 2.5 was highest in the afternoon. However, it was actually highest at night. So you have uh, the results of those tests there. This is an image of our sensor map, which combines regulatory sites, which are the stars, with QC and calibrated purple air data, and those are the circles. There are about 10 times as many purple airs in our area as there are regulatory sites, and so this adds a lot of spatial information. It also adds a lot of temporal information because the purple airs report one minute data, whereas the regulatory sites are reporting hourly data. And when you're looking at this map as a health view that we're seeing here, you're getting a 24 hour estimate. So that's, this is the purpose of this is to compare the different sites with a focus on air quality and health. If you look at the instant view, you see just the purple layers, just the one minute data. And the advantage of that view is seeing air quality change rapidly during an air pollution event, such as a wildfire. And with this enhanced spatial information, we can see it come into our area and leave our area basically as it happens. Whereas the reference sites are at about a two hour lag. It takes them an hour to record the information and then to report it, it takes about another hour as well. And this is how the data processing works in the background. First, you drop the hours where both sensors don't have any data then you remove values that are either too high or too low. Too low is if the total particle count is less than 10. And this is listed in the 0 0.3 micrometer size bin, which is the count of all particles greater than that diameter. And you would never really expect that to be zero, not even in a clean indoor environment. The high cutoff is greater than 1000 micrograms per meter cubed. And you might say that, well, there are some instances where you'll see values higher than that, and that's true. And if you're concerned about this, I would suggest setting it to 3000 because there are some known error states above 3000. And at least in our area, 90% of the values above 1000 are above 3000, indicating that error state. Then we compare the two sensors within the purple air monitor to each other and we flag them if they haven't agreed well over the past three days, or if they're not agreeing well for that hour. And the three day test is using Lin's concordance, which is kind of like an R squared, but it also, also measures the distance to the one-to-one -one line. And what that gets us uh, thinking about is signal attenuation. And if one sensor is reading lower than another sensor or vice versa. Uh, if they're not reading well for that hour, then clearly there's a more serious break between the two sensors. This represents about 5% of the data. Then we compare sensors between different monitors. And if the sensors are a certain amount below or above the median of all nearby sensors, then they're flagged. Nearby here is calculating using a semivariogram which is a measure of difference by distance. 
And so it tries to get at what sites might be experiencing similar conditions now for that hour. About 3% of data is flagged for this. And if you're just looking at that data, that 5% where the comparison between the sensors doesn't have an answer, about 30% of that is flagged and the rest of it is okay. Then we calibrate either to a nearby site, if that calibration equation has an R squared greater than 0.5, or to the EPA national background about two thirds of the time. So here are two error states that you'll see with the purple air sensors. There's a sudden failure mode. And you can see on the y-axis, this is jumping up to about 3,300. So that's why I was suggesting 3,000 is also a decent cutoff point. Because you'll see this. And a comparison between the two sensors in the monitor, that will tell you that this is happening. And because it's that high, you know which one's wrong. But what about all the time before it jumped up that high and after it jumped up that high? The information and the flagging of that one sensor that it turns out has actually been performing poorly the whole time is primarily done by the intermonitor QC and knowing what the monitors around it are, is saying. Then you have <clears throat> sensor attenuation where the yellow highlighted sensor on this bottom graph is reading much lower than the other sensor. Now you might look at this graph and say, oh, well, you know, it's only reading five micrograms per meter cubed max, so clearly that's wrong. But this is just one example of many examples I've seen. And some of them I've done my best just to guess personally by looking at it, and you really can't tell. So having that comparison between the monitors does provide valuable information. Finally, I'd like to present this uh, little tool that is basically just a management tool. It helps me manage all these different apps. You can turn them on, turn them off, reboot them, add a new app, update an app, etc. without having to go through a lot of either manual work or scripting in Linux on the Amazon Web Services server, AWS server. This just allows you to press a button, turn it on, turn it off, update it, etc. It's an R Studio add-on, so you know these shiny apps are built in R. Uh, if you uh, install this package, then you can get this add-on. And after you set up your Amazon Web Services account, which is pretty simple, you provision an EC2 instance, you could get started pretty much right away, creating a new app and you know updating it, etc. So the next steps here are to do some user testing of the tools in the air sensor dashboard, um, particularly the community reporter, which we're trying to get some interest in that and some testing. And then just a note here that the tools can be scaled to larger geographies. It's not within the purview of our agency to do that, but if someone were interested in that, you know, these run on load balanced auto scaling groups. That basically means that the more people that come to them, the bigger the server um, grows. And, you know, with some optimization tweaks, you could get that to run nationwide or worldwide. So thank you. And I'd love to take any questions during the Q&A. And definitely feel free to reach out.